Sister Samina from Wisconsin, uh, she says that she has heard a lot about the uh, Salafi and Ash'ari ideologies or theologies, and uh, she's asking, can I explain the difference between uh, these two uh, theologies or ideologies? فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ uh, This question is actually a very uh, common one and anybody who is in any way, fashion or form linked with the da'wah scene or with the online uh, debates and issues or even with Islamic scholarship, uh, they're very well aware of these two strands within mainstream Sunnism. Uh, at the same time, those that are not involved with the online da'wah scene, those that are not involved with Islamic academics, they are uh, blissfully, alhamdulillah, unaware and these two names might not even be known to them. Uh, and so we have to really take a step back and understand that uh, the religion of Islam, of course, uh, since the very beginning uh, of the uh, of the uh, death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Muslim community has attempted to interpret various issues and controversies in different ways. We are all aware of the Sunni Shia divide, which uh, again goes back to very very early Islam. Uh, what a lot of people are vaguely aware of is that even within Ahl Sunnah or Sunnism, there are a number of interpretations or uh, trends. And these two terms that are being asked about today, they apply to two different interpretations or do two slightly different theologies within uh, mainstream uh, Sunnism. Now, of course, the term Sunni, I've talked about this in other lectures, uh, the term Sunni comes from Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. This is a term that uh, first was in vogue, we can say definitely within the first 50 years of the death of the Prophet within the first hundred years we actually have references of treatises and people talking about Ahl Sunnah so it's a very early term and the meaning of Ahl Sunnah or Sunni was the uh, group of Muslims who a number of things combined them first and foremost they viewed the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, as being of paramount importance second only to the Quran so this group of Muslims followed the Quran and the Sunnah hence they're called Sunni now of course there are other interpretations of Islam the Shia community uh, considers the need to have a living Imam and so the Imam takes on for what for the Sunnah does for the Sunnis the Imam does for the Shia community that he interprets the law and, uh, and, and so they have a different notion uh, and of course uh, other groups have other interpretations of what they're going to follow. So the Sunni community wanted to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hence they're called Ahl Sunnah. Also another thing that united all of them is the respect for the Sahaba. All of the Sahaba are considered to be worthy of respect and the Sunni community does not say anything negative or bad about any Muslim who accompanied the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's another hallmark of Sunni Islam. Another hallmark of Sunni Islam is their belief in predestination or Qadr. Uh, Non-Sunni groups generally do not believe in Qadr. They don't believe that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, uh, wills the actions of the uh, of the of the people but rather they have ultimate free will and uh, ahl sunnah believes that uh, allah azza wa jal uh, knows and also to a certain level wills as well and therefore uh, there is the belief of uh, qadr and there are other uh, aspects of sunni islam now this is generic uh, sunnism by the way one more thing we can say is that historically speaking the sunni community uh, gathered around the legitimate khalifa whether it was the umayyads or the abbasids or the ottomans or whoever their local governors were, even if they didn't like them, but they felt that the community is more important than uh, breaking away and fighting against the caliph and whatnot. That's a legitimate khalif, obviously, that uh, used to exist in the past. Now, these are all things that com combined mainstream, if you like, uh, Sunnism. Now, uh, obviously, uh, as time developed within this strand, within this interpretation, Various theologians came and the finer details or the more difficult questions were answered in diverse manners. And therefore, uh, the question that I'm answering today, the two terms Salafi and Ash'ari. And to point out that both of these two terms are somewhat contested, in particular the term Salafism, that the term Salafism applies to a strand or a group that actually has multiple terms, whether you call it Athari uh, or you call it Hanbali theology uh, or 
the modern iteration is Salafism, that is one strand, and, and it is uh, considered to be uh, the, the one that is predominant in uh, Saudi Arabia and in other places in the Muslim world. And the other strand we're talking about it is Ash'arism, and that goes back to a particular individual by the name of Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari, Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari, who died around 320 Hijra. And uh, he was one of the first to develop uh, a type of systematic theology that then paved the way for what we now call uh, Ash'arism. And of course, in our times, we have very famous adherence to both of these strands. They go at, back very early in Islam. They have produced scholarship, they have produced ulama, they have produced works, they have produced institutions, and they are in some ways rival schools. In some ways, they are rivaling one another and they are competing for more adherence and refutations, which is what happens when you have uh, any anything of this uh, of this nature. Now, how and why do they differ? And again, this is a very packed uh, summary. Obviously, as usual, I give the caveat that so much more can be said. Time is always limited. For those who are completely, un, you know, they're not aware of these differences. Let me be very simplistic and summarize the differences in three uh, primary ways or three primary notions. This is not exhaustive. It's just an introduction. First and foremost is the concept and the definition of Iman, of Iman. What exactly is Iman? So the Ash'ari movement or the Ash'ari strand says that Iman is Tasdiq, which is affirmation of the heart or belief in the heart. So if you believe, then you are a Muslim and a Mu'min. If you believe, then you have Iman. Iman is that which is in the heart. It is to affirm with your heart, to know in your heart that Allah exists. The Prophet ﷺ is true. The Quran is the book of Allah. If you know it in your heart and you believe it in your heart, then this is Iman. So they say Iman is Tasdiq. The, in contrast to this, uh, um, the Athari school or the, uh, the Salafi school says that Iman is that which exists in the heart, is affirmed by the tongues and is then practiced by the actions. And it goes up and it goes down. It increases and it decreases, right? Uh, of course, the Ash'ari school believes that Iman itself does not increase or decrease because they view Iman, uh, I, the analogy gives like a light switch binary, either one or zero. You either have it or you don't. It's either up, the light is on, or down, the light is off. So from their perspective, Iman is very much like a binary code. You either have it or you don't. You either know Allah is true and your creator and the process is true or you don't. There is no middle ground and there is no increase or decrease of actual Iman. Whereas the, uh, the Salafi school would say that Iman, the actual term Iman, consists of belief in the heart, statements of the tongue and actions of the limbs, and it increases and it decreases. It increases uh, if you do more good deeds or you're in the spiritual state of mind, or you go for Hajj and Umrah, you're in the month of Ramadan, and it decreases when you're committing uh, sins, when you're away from Allah Azza wa Jalla, when your heart has ghafla. And the actual term Iman applies to actions as well. So actions, according to the Salafis, are an integral part of Iman. It's not just a byproduct. It is within the term Iman and what we call Iman, it comes within it. And of course, they therefore believe that actual Iman increases and decreases. And therefore, when Allah says in the Quran that Iman goes up, uh, that it's actually Iman going uh, increasing and decreasing. As for the Ash'ari school, uh, they interpret these verses to mean that their Iman is affirmed, not necessarily it increases. So this is uh, one difference, the concept and definition of Iman. Another difference between the Salafi and Ash'ari schools is the importance and the methodology of proving the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and so the, uh, generally speaking, the Ash'ari school, uh, their textbooks of theology, they follow a particular methodology of beginning with trying to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then doing that in a very particular method. Uh, it is called in English the Kalam cosmological argument. This is a very specific method of proving Allah's existence. If you, if you study any course about proving God's existence, if you study any book, you will find three or five or 10 or 15 different methods that have been used historically to try to prove the existence of Allah or existence of God. And one of them, it is called the Kalam or the cosmological proof or the Kalam cosmological proof. And this is a proof that uh, its very origins, it goes back to Aristotle. You find reference of it actually even in Plato, you find a line or two, but Aristotle definitely has the rudimentary developments. But then early Muslim theologians from another school called Mu'tazilism, 
Abu al-Hudayl al-Allaf is one of the main people, they develop a very rudimentary methodology of proving Allah's existence. And this uh, tactic or this methodology is then adopted by the Ash'ari school and then sanitized and then it becomes a feature of that uh, school. And again, very interesting uh, way of doing that um, beyond the scope of our, our, our particular um, you know, Q&A here. But basically, I mean, to be very, very simplistic, uh, it relies on the fact that the world around us consists of actual bodies. So this is a body, the table is a body, I'm a body, everything is a body. And that bodies, they have within them, subsisting within them, uh, things that they call attributes or, or accidents. And accidents are that which subsists within a body. And so an accident would be uh, color or temperature or size, X, Y, and Z coordinates. These are all accidents. By accidents, we don't mean like a car accident. By accidents, we mean that which subsists within a physical structure called a, a body. And so they have a very elaborate proof where they demonstrate that accidents must be created. And if accidents are created and accidents can only exist in bodies, then bodies must also be created. And therefore, if the body is created, there must be a creator who created the bodies. It's a very simplistic way of the Kalam cosmological argument. And this is uh, a backbone of Ash'ari theology. The existence of God is important to prove and then how you prove it. In contrast to this, the Salafi movement, generally speaking, says that the existence of God is something that does not require elaborate proofs, and that it is something that is inherently ingrained in, man in mankind, and that to deny this is to deny something that is self-evident. Hence, no matter how many proofs you try to give, uh, it's somewhat um, of a waste of time, it's somewhat superfluous to try to prove the obvious. And so, generally speaking, the Salafi school does not prioritize philosophical proofs for the existence of God, believing that the existence of God is self-evident and does not require elaborate proofs. And then in particular, they say this mechanism of proving God is something that is uh, from their perspective problematic. And they say that uh, this Kalam cosmological argument, uh, when it is employed, uh, it actually leads to subsidiaries or corollaries that are problematic. And most importantly is how this uh, proof affects the interpretation of Allah's names and attributes, which is point number three of our list. So point number one was the definition of Iman. Point number two would be uh, the, uh, the, the importance of and how one proves the existence of God, the importance of proving, not the importance of, we all believe it's important to believe Allah exists, but the importance of proving that Allah exists. The Ash'ari school says the most important obligation is to prove Allah exists. And the Salafi school says the most important obligation is the worship of Allah. We assume, everybody should assume that Allah, that people know that Allah Azza wa Jal exists. And then the third point of difference is the concept of Allah's attributes. And this is the most contentious. And this is what the schools are most famous for arguing about. This is really the area of controversy that any average you know, internet user is aware of, any average person who is involved with polemics, involved with you know, online debates, involved with the, the various you know, Muslim communities out there, they are well aware that this is the issue in which there's so much, you know, sometimes even uh, online antagonism. How does one understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَيَبَقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكْ The face of your Lord shall remain. When Allah says in the Quran that I created Adam with both of my hands, خَلَقْتُ بِيَدَيَّ when Allah says in the Quran, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa, the Rahman has risen over the throne. When Allah says in the Quran, Waja'a rabbuka wal malaku saffan saffa, your Lord will come on the day of judgment and the angels will come in rank upon rank. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yanzilu rabbuna, our Lord comes down in the last third of the night. Uh, when Allah azza wa jal says, Yakhafuna rabbahum min fawqihim, they fear their Lord who is above them. How does one understand all of these uh, genre of attributes. As for the Salafi school, the Salafi school says that if Allah says it, Allah knows best how he is, and therefore we should simply affirm the word and not think about how. We don't 
think and we don't uh, consider how. And so we leave the howness to Allah Azza wa Jal. That if Allah Azza wa Jal says he has a wedge, a face, so then we say he has a face, but we don't think about how it is. If Allah says he rises over the throne, so be it. This means he has a throne and he has risen over it and we leave it at that. We don't think about how. This is called bal kafa or bila kayf. You negate the howness. So the Salafi school is famous as the only school in all of Islam that affirmed every single verb or adjective or noun ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they said the word's meaning is understood, the word's howness is relegated to Allah. We don't think how it is. So this is the Salafi paradigm. As for the uh, Ash'ari school, they said that we will only take seven of those attributes and affirm them with the Bila Kayf doctrine. So seven attributes, we will affirm them like the, the, uh, the Salafis do, uh, meaning that what I say like, not exactly like, but let me just say for the purposes of our Q&A, that they will affirm them without any Kayf, without how. And these are life and knowledge and will and power and hearing and seeing and speech. These are the seven attributes that the Ash'ari say Allah has life, uh, haya, and Allah has sama, and Allah has basar, and Allah has qudra, and Allah, uh, and Allah Azza wa is, is uh, sami' and basir, and Allah has a sifa of kalam, and qudra. So all of these we shall affirm bila kayf. We're not going to think about how. However, all the other attributes we cannot affirm uh, because that would imply that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a body. And so this goes back to our Kalam cosmological argument. One of the attributes is that of motion. One of the attributes is that of motion. Something moves, this is an attribute. Motion does not exist by itself. There must be a body that cause that you know motion exists within. And so in order to prove point number two, which is how God exists, they have an elaborate proof, the Kalam cosmological argument, and they prove that attributes are created. They prove that attributes must exist within bodies, and then they prove that bodies must be created. And one of the attributes is motion. Now, you come to the verse, that your Lord has risen over the throne. And to rise is a type of motion. You come to the hadith, your Lord comes down, and that is a type of motion. You come to the verse in the Quran, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكُ Your Lord comes, and that is a type of motion. And so, the Ash'ari school says, clearly Allah did not intend these literal meanings, because they say, if you affirm those verbs, you are affirming the attribute of motion. And if you affirm the attribute of motion, this implies a'udhu billah, that God is a body. And if God is a body, then a'udhu billah, all bodies are created. Again, go back to the Kalam cosmological proof, right? Motion is an accident. Accidents must exist in bodies. Bodies are created. So if you ascribe to Allah istiwa and nuzul and maji, if you ascribe to Allah these concepts from the Ash'ari paradigm, you will logically conclude that whoever has that attribute must also be a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, created. And so from their paradigm, they say, no, we cannot affirm those types of attributes to Allah. And they also say the attributes of hand and face, this is anthropomorphic, it is uh, human-like. And Allah says in the Quran, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like him. And so we say that all of this is metaphorical or symbolic, or they might say, all of this, our minds should go blank and we should not even think about the meaning of the word. Even the word, we just go blank. So when Allah says waj or face, we don't even think of waj, we just go blank. That's one way of doing this, it's called tafwil. Or the other way is to say that, well, by face, Allah meant his blessings, his countenance. By rising over the throne, Allah meant his dominion has conquered the world. And so they, it's called ta'wil or reinterpretation. So the Ash'ari school has two positions, both of which are fine for them. Uh, position A, you completely block out any meaning, any linguistic meaning. As for the Salafi school, remember, they will say, we'll affirm the linguistic meaning, but we will deny how it exists in Allah. We will say that Allah rises over the throne, but we we'll, won't think about how that occurs. And as for the Ash'ari school, they will say, no, clearly there is no actual throne, there is no actual rising over, and so uh, that's uh, it has to be negated. Then, either you have one of two options. Either you say, this whole phrase and passage, we simply go blank and don't think about it at all, or, 
it becomes metaphorical for Allah has power over the entire creation. Allah has risen over the throne. Allah has dominion over the entire creation. So these are some of the main differences. And of course, one of the more common questions that uh, the Salafi Ash'ari debate has online is the famous uh, debate, where is Allah? Where is Allah? And the Salafi says that the Quran and Sunnah indicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us. And there are hundreds of verses and ahadith that indicate what is called transcendence, your Allah is above. يَخَافُونَ رَبَّهُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِهِمْ That they fear their Lord who is above them. And uh, the Prophet asked the slave girl, where is Allah? And she said, Allah is above us. And so there's so many, uh, you know, um, a hadith and ayat. And then to counter this, the Ash'ari school says, you clearly don't mean above in the three-dimensional sense because what is above for one part of the world is below for the other part and because three dimensions and because, you know, all of this goes on and on and on. And by the way, this is a very brief intro. Every single point that I have said, the other group has a counterpoint. And the other group has a second counterpoint. The other group has a third counterpoint. Ad infinitum, it goes on and on and on and on. These debates have occupied the minds of theologians for no exaggeration, 12 if not 13 centuries. And so much has been written, you could spend many lifetimes, no exaggeration, going deep into these controversies and uh, back and forth and back and forth. And so this is something that, uh, and I would know because this is my area of expertise and I have in fact spent not lifetimes, but many decades um, studying uh, advanced issues of theology. So there is a lot to be said, we're summarizing here, that these are some of the main differences between these two schools, the Salafi school and the Ash'ari school. And uh, of course, these schools have famous scholars from the beginning of time. The Salafi school claims like Imam Ahmad, of course, the most famous icon is Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim. Uh, and then the Ash'ari school has many famous ulama. The, their most famous icon is uh, uh, Imam Al-Ghazali, for example. So you have various, you know, personalities that throughout history, they have manifested in both of these um, schools. And to compound the problem, to make it even more, you know, complicated, that all that I described to you is actually early or classical Salafism and Ash'arism. Historically, a lot of other things happened because it's been around for 12 centuries, no exaggeration. 12 centuries, these two trends have existed side by side at times moments of tension, at times moments of reconciliation. And so a lot has happened. And of the things that has happened uh, for reasons beyond the scope of our brief Q&A is that the, the Salafi school has been associated with one particular madhab, the Hanbali madhab. And generally speaking, the Hanbali scholars were in some fashion or form within the spectrum of uh, Salafism or Atharism to be more precise, uh, or Ahl al-Hadith is also called. And the uh, Maliki and the Shafi'i school, they gravitated towards uh, Ash'arism. By the way, footnote here, so there's a third trend as well. So there's something called Maturidi or Maturidism as well. So we have Ash'arism, Salafism, and Maturidism. And Maturidis and Ash'aris are uh, very, very close. The, the differences are even more abstract than what I've just done between Salafis and Ash'aris. For example, the Maturidis affirm eight attributes instead of seven. So very, very small, very technical details between the Maturidi and the Ash'ari school. In reality, they even consider each other to be sister schools, and there's a very little difference between them. And the Maturidi school was basically co-opted by the Hanafi madhab. The Ottomans, they took the Hanafi school and the Maturidi school of theology, and they merged it together. And so, historically, two of the madhabs became, became because in the beginning they had, you know, that's beyond the scope, but they became Ash'ari. One of them became Maturidi, and one of them, you know, um, became Hanbali, so, oh, sorry, um, uh, Salafi. And so that's been the, the reality uh, for the last so many uh, centuries. And along with this, other changes came along, which further complicated the discussions between them, which did not exist in early uh, the founding of these schools. And of them is, uh, in particular, various understandings of tasawwuf, of how one practices Sufism, right? And this is another major controversy between all of these uh, schools. So for example, to, to give you one simple example, and I'm not gonna answer it here, but I'll just give it to you now. The Indian Pakistanis are aware of the Barelvi movement and the Deobandi movement. Both Barelvis and Deobandis are under the Maturidi Hanafi spectrum, right? So you see now that 
you have a, a mother school and then it has two children and then they divide two. It's literally like a madrasa becomes more and more and you have all of these splinters happening. We haven't even begun the political divisions now between political Islam, apolitical Islam, because that too plays a role in all of this type of, of um, uh, interpretation. And then you have, of course, the understanding of uh, tasawwuf and awliya and the visitation of graves and the uh, veneration of graves and the exaltation of saints and the role of saints. All of this has permeated so that uh, the differences are no longer just those three. Even though technically those three and some others should be the only differences, but historically other differences were added. So for example, to celebrate the mawlid or to not celebrate the mawlid. This is a classic divide between modern Salafism and modern Ash'arism, this did not exist 500, 1,000 years ago, that division did not exist over molded stuff, but this is something that is uh, in the grand scale of things relatively more recent. In any case, I can go on and on and on, but you wanted a brief explanation, and this is a brief explanation, as I explained that you have uh, very many ulama from the Salafi school historically and in our times, and uh, the University of Medina, which I graduated from, is associated with that strand of Islam as well, uh, and it is predominant in Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and the scholars that have studied there, uh, and have been influenced by uh, the revivalistic movement of that region. And uh, Al-Azhar University, for example, is uh, on the Ash'adi strand, and there are again many famous ulama historically and in our times as well. Now, these are some of the differences. Let us not forget though, that the similarities between these two schools is actually far more than their differences. And especially when you compare them to other strands of Islam. In the end of the day, both of these schools believe in the six pillars of Iman as expressed in the Hadith of Jibreel. Both of these schools, they affirm the Quran and the Sunnah as the primary sources of theology and law. Both of these schools, they have the same ways of looking at fiqh and of deriving fiqh. In fact, they have the same books of fiqh and the same scholars of fiqh in University of Medina and in Al-Azhar, they study the same curriculums in terms of the books of fiqh, in terms of the books of hadith, in terms of the books of usul al-fiqh, in terms of the books of history, in terms of the books of language, in terms of the books of tafsir. In reality, the scholars of each movement are studied by the scholars of the other, even if there's some tensions at times, you know, between modern uh, understandings. And that's something that needs to be stressed is that what they share is far, far more than what they differ over and historically Salafis and Ash'aris have never have never divided themselves in different masajid or in completely different you know boycotting I mean unfortunately sometimes you get calls to do that but realistically it's never happened Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah and we need to keep it that way the tensions even though they should not be there have always been at an academic level and my advice, as I conclude this question, my advice is that, you know, in both of these strands, you have scholars that are aiming to exacerbate the tension. They want to make it worse. They want to preach against the other and make the other into a deviant and show how evil the other side is misguided. And you also have scholars that try to work together and find commonality. And the fact of the matter, whether, you know, I, you know, whether people like me saying this or not is true, the average Muslim is completely in blissful unawareness of these differences between these two strands. In fact, the differences between them does not affect the lay Muslim at all. It doesn't really translate to their daily uh, life in terms of these abstract issues of uh, classical um, early Salafism and early uh, Ash'arism. And currently we are facing crises in every single arena of our life political, economic, you know, the nation state issues, the various invasions taking place, the crises of Syria and of Afghanistan and of Palestine. On top of this, we have crises of intellectual challenges and people are, uh, you know, uh, uh, rebuke us, uh, refuting aspects of our creed that we all agree upon. So rather than allow these tensions to increase, what we need to do is to work to minimize, in fact, to eradicate any tensions. Now, I am not saying that these differences are trivial. What I am saying is that we should not make a big deal out of them. And those who want to dedicate their lives to the study of Islam, at some point they will have to make a choice, which textbooks they wanna study and which groups of scholars they wanna study for. I myself had to make the choice 
20, what, 25 years ago, I chose between Medina and Azhar, for example, I chose, I went the way that I did, I do not regret that. Uh, so we, at some point, you might have to make that choice, but if you make such a choice to study with one side, don't demonize the other side. Don't consider the other side to be a'udhu billah evil or misguided or going to Jahannam. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. There is iman and taqwa across all sides. And there's also nifaq and fisq on all sides as well. You have genuine piety and you have the opposite. So just because you study one version of Islam versus the other does not make you more pious. We have to be very clear about this. Piety transcends these human creeds and these differences between us. And you find righteous ulama and righteous ubad and awliya in both of these strands, and in fact, in more than just these two strands. And we need to look at that as well. So what we have in common is far, far more important than what divides us. And therefore, we should not give platforms to preachers who exacerbate tensions between these movements. Rather, we should simply don't even pay them attention because there are people like this, you know, on both sides, by the way. You have, you know, and I'll be honest here, 25 years ago, I myself was more sympathetic to that strand of harshness and considering them to be deviant, but that's young age. When I was 20, is different now. You know, wisdom and experience teaches you, seeing the realities of the ummah, it reorients your mind here. SubhanAllah, these are people, both sides, there are people that are praying to the same God, following the same fiqh even, the same methodology to pray even, not even differences in fiqh and usul al-fiqh, they're pretty much the same in everything. It's just certain abstract notions that, you know, in any case, so my point being, uh, you asked a question, this is the answer to it, I summarize the differences, and I say that Salafism and Ash'arism, and you can add Mathurism as well, they are two or three sister strands within mainstream Sunnism, and there are differences, and let the advanced students study those differences, but the Average person should never, ever make those differences the defining characteristic of himself or of the other. And the laity of the ummah, really, alhamdulillah, there's no need for them to really get involved in these labels whatsoever because it does not affect them in their daily lives. And alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, what unites these two strands is so much more that really we can say that for practical purposes, the differences are really trivial. And that's the way that we uh, should uh, look at these two strands. And in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Ya man ajab